we are in the midst of a brand new year. Several months ago, the staff came together and I said, you know, what really helps me is to have a clear focus and a clear purpose. I said, what, what do we want to... What do we want to focus on in the new year? I said, it needs to have nothing to do with selling a house or putting a roof on this building. And you know what? Check. Both done before the end of 2013. And so we brainstormed, we joked, we created all kinds of goofy sayings. And we landed in celebrating our divine destiny. And you know, we struggled a little bit with that word destiny. Because we really were focusing on an awareness that in our culture, destiny often is seen as predestined. That we have to have something happening. No matter what we do, like free will doesn't exist, we're going somewhere. No, that's not what we're talking about. A divine destiny, a highest expression of our consciousness. Our divine destiny can, some some may say, be summed up in the second unity principle. Sometimes people say, well, does unity have dogma? Well, that just depends on what day it is and who you ask. But really, the gist is, there's one presence, that presence lives within us. And we focus that attention by looking at what we want to experience more of with our prayer and attention, our meditation practices, and then we choose to live it. And so our divine destiny is that second principle that says, That wonderful thing which we say is one presence and one power lives within us. And that's how we can celebrate our divine destiny. But you know, I said, no, we we got to massage this a little bit more. How do we claim it? How do we count on it? And how do we celebrate it? How do we claim that there is this place within us that lives an essence, a connection to the one presence and one power, a potential that knows no boundaries. How do we claim that? So I have a couple of ideas for us this morning. One of the ways that we claim it is that we get to acknowledge we are worthy of it. You can't claim your prize if you win the lottery if you don't know you're worthy of it. And this is our lottery, our spiritual lottery. And how do we know we're worthy of it? We do some of the things that we've done the last two weeks here in our community. We had the burning bowl ceremony where we wrote on this lovely little flash paper, limiting beliefs, thoughts, or ideas, even grudges, that somewhere in our body and in our mind we're holding Limitation. Because if we hold ourselves or we hold someone else in limitation, the universe doesn't really care. You're pointing to your partner because there's something that's happened, some past experience. It doesn't matter if you're holding it for yourself or your partner, yourself or your boss. All the universe knows is that you are absolutely not claiming your worthiness of your divine destiny. So we have to let it go. So let's say that together. I have to let it go. Together? I have to let it go. Don't know if I believe you. As a teacher of mine would say, no, 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 you get to let it go. So let's try that. I get to let it go. Together? I get to let it go. Yes, we get to let it go. Joseph Campbell has this wonderful quote, and he says, We must be willing to let go of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. 
We have to let it go. We have to let go of the need to know. We have to let go of thinking that we already know. We have to let go. If you've ever tried to teach someone how to swim, you know that if you go to a body of water where there's a lot of salt, they might have a little bit more success because there's a buoyancy in that salt water. But have you ever tried to lie back and float in the water and hold yourself like this? We have to let go, just like we're floating in the water. My white stone word from last week where we set a powerful intention as an individual was let go, love has me. Can you feel the shift? Because I can talk about letting go all day long. Don't resist. What you resist persists. Resisting life. Resisting change is resisting life. Whatever those cliches are. And yet when we know that we let go because we're supported by an infinite universe. There's no place where we could be that we're unsupported. Now, our perception may be that we're unsupported, but that leads us to the second thing. So if we're going to be worthy of it and claim it, we got to count on it. We have to count on the fact that there's one presence and one power and it lives within us. We have to believe it. We have to bring faith into our experience of a day-to-day journey. And that's really where when we pay attention to what we are resisting, often we realize we are resisting life. And I know that that's a phrase that, that can challenge all of us. I like for things to stay just the same. I'm honest. But you know, I went back to a church several years ago where I had worked, and the order of service, the way they did Sunday service, was exactly the same as when I had been there four years prior. And I sat in that room, and for me, knowing the power of creativity and knowing the creativity that lives in that room when I was there, I couldn't help but feel a heaviness. When we resist change, it's like we're pushing it down and we're saying, no thank you, no thank you to life. No thank you to counting on there's one presence and one power. Ah, yet there are no exceptions. There's always only one presence and one power. Even in the most traumatic experiences, There's a woman, her name is Alice Summer, S-O-M-M-E-R. She's 109 years old, and she's a concert piano player. She's also the oldest Holocaust survivor left on the planet. It's a beautiful movie. It's an independent movie, about 40 minutes, called The Lady in Number Six. The Lady in Number Six. She lives in England. She still has her upright Steinway in her little apartment where she lives independently. And she plays it every day. And she plays from memory. For you see, she was 39 when she was taken to the concentration camp. And she was taken to the concentration camp which fed into Auschwitz. And while being there, she and her young son, discovered that this was the place they took the Jews who had extraordinary talents. And so there were musicians all over this concentration camp. And in the video, they interview some of her friends. And it's fascinating because she even says, 
I'll let my friends speak about this more. Because you see, she is so clear. She is so clear in counting on the good. She said, even in the bad, there's good. Even in the bad, there's good. I don't know about you guys, but I can't sit around and feel sorry for myself after I think about that. I don't know bad. I might know struggle. I might know pain. And she said, we played music for each other. And then the German soldiers would come, and they could come into the auditorium and ask for any song, and whoever knew it would play it. She said, I loved music. Music is love. She said, music is God. This is a woman who found an avenue of self-expression of her divine destiny with which she could absolutely count on the awareness of one presence. One presence goodness in the world, and goodness that rises beyond a duality of good and bad, a goodness that says we are all connected. And she said, periodically I have Germans who will come and visit me now, and they will stand outside my door of my apartment, and they will wait, and they will ask me, can you tolerate my coming into your apartment? And she says, oh, yes, there was never bad in an individual. It was just how bad outpictured. 109. I want to be able to claim it like that. How about you? Amen. 109. What she focuses on today, she experiences still just as what she focused on then, she experienced. Her name is Alice Summer, S-O-M-M-E-R. So once we claim it, once we count on it, then we get to celebrate it. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You all are so wrapped, I think, sometimes in what I say. I'm looking at your faces, and I'm like, are we celebrating? Are we happy? Are we joyful? Are we ready to go? Are we knowing that we're here to fuel up, to be the light out into the world? I know that to be true. I know that that's why we come together in community. So a young man, 13-year-old, his name is Logan LaPlante. He's homeschooled, and he did a TEDx talk, and this is what he says. You know, I'm 13, and I'm homeschooled, and lots of people think that that's very controversial, and he says... But they ask me, what is it that you want to be when you grow up? And he says, I want to be happy and healthy. And public education was not teaching me that. He said behind that statement, often people are saying, what do you want to do when you grow up? He said, now that's a different question. Yet ultimately... His way of celebrating his divine destiny is to know that he's creating experiences for himself to anchor his awareness in his own divine power to be happy and to be healthy. It's a wonderful TEDx talk. I invite you to Google it and watch it online. When we choose to say yes to claiming, counting on, and celebrating our divine destiny, we can bring an awareness that every experience we're having, whether it's health, relationship, financial, work, every experience we're having is an opportunity to bring our God self, our divine destiny and expression to the table. Let's anchor ourselves in prayer now in that awareness. 
If you're comfortable doing so, I invite you to close your eyes and to know that in this very moment, in this very room, we can let go because love has us. Perhaps there is a situation or a a relationship that feels like sandpaper. Let us affirm that that sandpaper is simply filing down those edges that are not part of our true nature. That the one presence and one power that is here right now is transforming, moving, shifting, healing, and illuminating our highest expression, our divine destiny. And for this awareness, we give thanks. And so it is, and so we let it be. Amen and amen.